Praise the Lord. How are you doing this day? It's Lord's Day. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Brother J.P. Timmons here of Christ Church International bringing you another Kingdom Living video. You know, the purpose of these videos is to teach you how to live a victorious life according to your promises and what's been given to you in the kingdom. You know, we are the sons of God now, not when you get to heaven. <clears throat> and so it's our responsibility to learn our place in the family of God and what he's called us to do and and the obstacles that Satan puts in our way and all of these things. And so this is the purpose of these broadcasts. And, and I, I hope they're a blessing to you. I know they're a blessing to many and they're different than you will find anywhere else. And you can, you can order our books and messages at our website, www.ccipublishing.net, or you can email us if you need spiritual help at Christ underscore church underscore int at yahoo.com. That's been our email address for about 25 or 30 years, I think now. You know, as we say, time passes fast when you're having a good time. Praise the Lord. I'm going to bring you a special message that's been on my heart since July the 3rd. You know, I don't bring videos that often, uh, try to, to bring one at least once a week. And I could do more, you know, as far as teaching basics and foundational truths and things of that nature. But I generally wait on the Lord, something that's on his heart. And, and, uh, he began speaking to me about this on, on July the 3rd. So it's been almost three weeks and, has to do with restoring the presence, restoring the presence of the Lord. You know, I think if you, if you were to stop and think about it, there's, there's really no reason to have a church service if the presence of the Lord's not going to be there. And I think you know, if especially if you're a very mature Christian, or even a lot of baby Christians realize you know, there's something wrong here in this church or something wrong in this service or maybe the pastor says something or, you know, it, it just, there's a check in your spirit or, you know, a, a, sometimes a grinding in your spirit where you think, you know, this isn't right. Maybe he brings false prophecy and we have a lot of churches here, especially the black churches in America where they bring in false prophets to prophesy money away from people. And you shouldn't sit in those services. You should get up and leave and not go to that church because the pastor has ulterior motives. And you need to be able to recognize true and false prophets. And I have a video on that, the 12 principles of true prophets. But today we want to talk about the presence of God. You know, my burden since God sent me to the church, my burden has always been for the young eagles. And by that I mean spiritual eagles the babies because the model they see you know you grow up the your, your model of the family is the family you grew up in and it can present problems when you get married because your wife's family model is different and, and sometimes in very 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 different especially if you're of a different culture you know if you're an american and you marry an african then you have a different culture or or if you're French and you marry someone from Spain, you're going to have a different culture. And this can present problems in your marriage if, they're, if you don't negotiate expectations. And so, unfortunately, the model a lot of the young eagles see today in churches is, is what the Balaam boys present. The biggest problem probably I have, Evelyn has when we go overseas is, is the fact that people think that that's the, that's the measure of success. I'm talking about young ministers. They want more power in their ministry, and that's the main thing. They'll say, Daddy, Daddy, I want more power. But then, you know, what kind of model do they have? What kind of role model do they have for the church and for, for five-fold ministers? 
And so that's always been on my heart. And then another thing, you know, you've maybe never been in a service where the presence of the Lord was very heavy. When I went to the Philippines and we put our own worship team together and worship is one of the keys. We'll talk about it later. Praise and worship and they're different. I did a video on that. Praise and worship, they're not the same thing. And that's one of the keys to the presence of, of God showing up. But almost every service we had in the Philippines, I mean, the presence of God was there two hours, three hours. People were just on their faces. I've only had that happen one time here in America. We had a seven and a half hour service. But when the presence of the Lord shows up, miracles happen. People don't want to leave. And there's reasons for that. So we need to restore the presence of the Lord to our churches. Like I said, you know, if, if the Lord's presence is not there, why have a service? Just go to the lake and go fishing. You know, you might find him there. A lot of people have left churches because of this. But it's not God's intent. God wants us to what? Not forsake the assembling of ourselves together. And even more as we see the end. And we see the end now. It's in sight. I can see the finish line. So we need to restore the presence of God to our churches. And if you're a pastor or a fivefold minister, an elder, and you want to do that in your church, then then I, I pray you'll take the steps of this video because a lot of people don't. A lot of pastors and churches, they want to control it themselves. And God will let you the whole time. He won't be there. He'll let you do whatever you want. <clears throat> you know, my wife and I have been to a number of churches here in Pueblo, Colorado. that are It's, it's like going to a library lecture. It's just, there's no, there's nothing spiritual going on. And I'm not even talking about, I'm talking about Pentecostal churches or they're teaching false doctrine. And it's difficult today to find a genuine church, but God's intent is to restore the presence of the Lord as he did in the Old Testament, which we're going to see. Praise the Lord. So a lot of people have never been in a service where the presence of God was heavy. You know, when I was at Lakewood Church, it, it, it never happened more than for maybe a few minutes, not hours like I've seen in, in, the, in overseas services. And so we're going to explore the reasons why that's the case, and, and it's even more difficult today. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. So, like I said, if you need spiritual help, you can email us. And I'd encourage you to order our book, especially for this message, Another Gospel, because one of the reasons that we don't see the presence of God in, in a church is they're preaching another gospel. They're not preaching the gospel of the kingdom that Jesus preached and that Paul preached and Peter preached and the apostle James preached the gospel of the kingdom. Praise God. And so, I want to begin by saying, you know, one of the things the Holy Spirit told me years ago, and I wrote it in Living in the Now of Faith, because he brought it to my mind. He said, when you're reading the Bible, whenever you, you find a person that I devote a lot of time to, and by time, I mean, you know, when you're reading, it's words. When I give you a lot of details about that person and their life and their actions and what they did, he said, that means you need to study that person's life because you can learn a lot about me. That's what he said. That's what the Holy Spirit said. So we can learn a lot about God if we study people, you know, well, all people in the Bible, but especially, like he said, when he gives a lot of detail to someone's life, like Abraham, like David, like Jacob, like Joseph, like Paul, Study their life. And in the Old Testament, my brother and sister, no one did God devote more words to than who? The prophet Moses. Probably never thought about that. That means you need to study Moses' life. 
Even though we're not under the law, we can learn a lot. Now, something else I began to realize, and, and you should be this way too, when the Lord shows you a principle, you know, Evelyn's been after me for years to finish this book. I haven't even worked on it in years, but it's titled The Principles and Ways of God. You know, Moses learned the ways of God. He, he, God spoke to him face to face. We're going to read that scripture in a few moments. But in order to learn the ways and principles of God, you have to spend a lot of time in the word. And as you do, you see a pattern. You see patterns emerge. And I get more revelation from the Old Testament than the New because I see the type. I see the pattern. I see the revelation, and then I see it on and on. For example, I saw the revelation years ago that true men and women of God don't move until God tells them to. Noah didn't leave the ark, even though he'd been on dry ground for over a month. He didn't leave the ark till God told him to. Elijah did not leave the brook Cherith. Hey, it's dried up. Where, what am I going to have to drink? I've got to leave. I've got to go find some water. No, Elijah didn't leave. Why? Because God said, go to the brook Cherith and I will provide for you there. The brook dried up, so that's a circumstance. See, this is where you have to have the eye of the eagle. You have to be able to see things spiritually. The brook dried up. I don't care. Ravens are still coming. I've got food. <laughs> Amen. What am I going to drink? God said, I'll provide for you there. Now, until he changes that, which he did, he said, arise, go to Zarephath to a widow. I've told her to provide for you. God's obligated to provide for us when we're in his family. It's a wonderful revelation. It frees you from worry. You know, worry is a sin. You should never worry. God's obligated to provide for you. Praise God. But just because the brook dried up doesn't mean God can't provide. Amen. He made rivers in the desert for Elisha. He could, he, could have, he could have brought water. He could have had the rave. I mean, there's many ways he could have continued to perform his word. So we don't limit God, but we don't leave. We do not move. If we're a real man and woman of God, we do not move against the word of the Lord. Brook dried up. I got to leave. No, you don't. God said, I'll provide for you there. So many Christians get into trouble, my brother and sister, because they leave the place called there where God said he would provide. So let's don't limit God. So one of the principles then and that I learned from that, you know, when the Lord says something to you, then you can see something else. I realized, well, if, if I can learn a lot about God from the details of a person's life and how much more can I learn from God when he devotes, for example, a whole book to something like he did Leviticus. Leviticus, which is the Vulgate, last Latin translation was the Vulgate, which the Catholic Church used for years to keep people in darkness. But that title was Leviticus, which is a Latin word. But the book of Leviticus is designed to help us as Christians understand our priesthood. You know, what does the word say? The word says we're a priesthood of believers. And the book of Leviticus is about holiness. You know, what does the word say? The word says, without holiness, no one shall see the Lord. That's in the New Testament. God told Israel, be ye holy, for I am holy. And we find that in Leviticus. So wait a minute here. If God devoted a whole book to holiness and the priesthood, then we need to learn some things from it. Amen? And some of the things that we learn from Leviticus are, the book of Leviticus is replete 
with types and allusions to the person and work of Jesus Christ. Some of the more important include, number one, the five offerings. The burnt offering typifies Christ's total offering in submission to his Father's will. And we're going to be talking about the burnt offering today because there's a connection, my brother and sister, between the burnt offering and the altar and the light of God, the word of God, the fire of God. And he commanded in Leviticus 6.13 not to let the fire go out. That was one of the duties of the priest. And I think we can see, and we'll, probably, we'll talk about it more later, but we can see how that applies to us as Christians in our own lives and in the life of the church. We're not to let the light, we're not to let the fire go out. And if the presence of God is not there, then I submit that the light has gone out. And we need to restore that. So the burnt offering typifies Christ's total offering in submission to his Father's will. <clears throat> the meal offering typifies Christ's sinless service. The peace offering is a type of the fellowship believers have with God through the work of the cross. The sin offering typifies Christ as our guilt bearer. The trespass offering typifies Christ's payment for the damage of sin. And then number two, there's the high priest. There are several comparisons and contrasts between Aaron, the first high priest, and Christ, our eternal high priest. And of course, Jesus Christ is a priest after the order of Melchizedek, which is not the Aaronic priesthood, because Jesus came through the tribe of Judah, didn't he? He didn't come through the Levitical tribe. It's another proof that Levitical priests are not needed today because we have a new covenant based on better promises. And number three, the seven feasts are mentioned in Leviticus. Passover speaks of the substitutionary death of the Lamb of God. Christ died on the day of Passover. Unleavened bread speaks of the holy walk of the believer because leaven was a symbol of sin, wasn't it? They were not to have leavened bread on Passover. First fruit speaks of Christ's resurrection as the first fruits of the resurrection of all believers. Christ rose on the day of the first fruits. Pentecost speaks of the descent of the Holy Spirit <clears throat> after Christ's ascension. Trumpets, the day of atonement, and tabernacles speak of events associated with the second advent of Christ. This may be why these three are separated by a long gap from the first four in Israel's annual cycle. So we see there that the book of Leviticus, which the key theme of Leviticus is holiness, holiness. The priests, if the priests weren't holy, they dropped dead. They couldn't minister to the Lord. Amen. And we need to understand holiness. You know, God, one of the reformational, <clears throat> reformational moves of God was the holiness movement, which he used John Wesley to bring that to pass. Was a, he used others, but John Wesley was one of the first ones. And of course, he founded the Methodist Church. And, you know, I was raised a Methodist and, and it was founded on principles of holiness, which it's diverted from today, as anyone can see. So let's go back to, like I said, when the Lord told me to study a person's life. So probably no person in the Old Testament is there more on than Moses. So let's look at his part of his life. I want to bring out the part that has to do with the presence. You should study Moses' entire life. There's much to learn there, you know, like many of us. And I'm going to bring a message on this probably uh, later in the week on the, the Sabbath rest of God. But, we, you know, we try to do things in our own strength. And, you know, Abraham tried to bring God's promise forth through an Ishmael, and we have a tendency to do that as Christians instead of entering into the rest of God. 
So Moses, let's look in uh, Exodus chapter 33. And we're going to read verses 1 through 3 and then 11 through 17. Praise the Lord. Now, you remember that in chapter 33 is right after 32, where the golden calf was fashioned by Israel. And it was a sign not only of idolatry, but also showed a, a, a lack of patience. They didn't want to wait on the Lord. They couldn't wait more than 40 days. We have that problem today, many of us in churches. So Moses probably knew God better than anybody in the Bible. And we're going to find out in these scriptures that he understood the importance of God's presence in our lives. But where is that presence today in churches? You might also say, you know, where's the presence of God in my own life? Do you, do you hunger for the presence of God in your life? You should. And I'm going to show you how to restore that presence in your own life and in the life of your church. Praise God. Praise the Lord. So in Exodus 33, verse 1 through 3, after the golden calf, God wanted to destroy the nation and make another nation out of Moses. You'll remember that. And Moses interceded for the nation. <clears throat> and the Lord said to Moses, then after that, depart and go up from here, you and the people whom you have brought out of the land of Egypt, to the land of which I swore to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, saying to your descendants, I will give it. And I will send my angel, what's that's the angel of the Lord, isn't it? Before you, and I will drive out the Canaanite and the Amorite and the Hittite and the Parasite, <laughs> Parasite, Parasite, and the Hivite and the Jebusite, probably some other ites there too, Go up to a land flowing with milk and honey, for I will not go up in your midst. In other words, I'm going to send an angel. I'm not going to go. Why? Lest I consume you on the way. For you are a stiff-necked or stubborn people. So the Lord says, I'm not going to go. And so then Moses says, hey, Lord, if you're not going to go, I don't want to go. So skip down to verse 11. So the Lord spoke to Moses face to face as a man speaks to his friend and he would return to the camp. But his servant Joshua, the son of Nun, a young man, did not depart from the tabernacle. <clears throat> and then Moses said to the Lord, See, you say to me, bring up this people, but you have not let me know whom you will send with me. Yet you have said, I know you by name, and you have also found grace in my sight. Now, therefore, I pray if I have found grace in your sight, show me now your way that I may know you and that I may find grace in your sight and consider that this nation is your people. And the Lord said, my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. Then Moses said to him, if your presence does not go with us, do not bring us up from here. For how then will it be known that your people and I have found grace in your sight, except you go with us? So we shall be separate, your people and I, from all the people who are upon the face of the earth. Then the Lord said to Moses, I will also do this thing that you have spoken, for you have found grace in my sight, and I know you by name. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. So we find that Moses, <clears throat> being a man after God's own heart, the word tells us, <clears throat> that he understood, <clears throat> excuse me, 
the presence of the Lord and how much we need the presence of the Lord. Praise God. It, it was so important to Moses that he said, if, if your presence doesn't go with us, in other words, I'm not going to settle for the angel of the Lord. There's another testimony there that the angel of the Lord and the Lord are not the same person. So the Lord relents and says, okay, I'll do this. I'll go with you. And of course that presented problems as we know, because the people continued to be rebellious like many of us today. <clears throat> Praise God. And one of the things we have to do if we want his presence is we have to seek the Lord and we have to be patient. How often does the Bible say, seek the Lord, seek the Lord while he may be found, call upon him while he is near? We have to have patience. We have to develop the fruit of patience. And our idols and our monuments like the golden calf, they're monuments to our impatience. Now let's look over in Leviticus chapter 6 and remember you need to study Leviticus you need to understand the holiness and you need to understand that it was so important to God to establish holiness and the priesthood in the people that Israel didn't leave Mount Sinai till that was completed they stayed there and did not move while all this was established by the Lord, the priesthood and the principles of holiness and sacrifice, the grain offerings. The <clears throat> because if you think about it, and, and the type of Christ that I mentioned earlier from the book of Leviticus, you know, we can't move on with God. We can't move on with him in his presence if we haven't done those things, can we? And we can't be effective priests to the Lord if we're not holy and if we don't understand what he requires of us. So he kept them there a whole month. The book of Numbers begins when they left. He kept them there to teach them these principles, principles that we need to learn. Praise the Lord. So in Leviticus chapter 6, we're going to read verses 12 and 13. <clears throat> and the fire on the altar, what was that? It's the burnt offering, amen, the type of Jesus. The fire on the altar shall be kept burning on it. It shall not be put out. And the priest shall burn wood on it every morning and lay the burnt offering in order on it, and he shall burn on it the fat of the peace offerings. A perpetual fire shall burn on the altar. It shall never go out. Amen? Because Christ's sacrifice, my brother and sister, was eternal. And so we see the type there. And the fire, my brother and sister, is a type of Jesus Christ, the light of the word, and the fire of his holiness, and the holiness of the Holy Spirit. They're all typed in this. And the priests were commanded not to let the fire go out. <clears throat> but then we see over in Samuel, 1 Samuel, and Samuel was raised up for this purpose. You know, the Word of God tells us that there was no widespread revelation in those days. The Word of God was rare because Eli was the chief priest and his sons were priests and they were evil, wicked men, the Word tells us. They were evil, wicked men. They didn't, this is 1 Samuel chapter 2. You should, you should read these scriptures as well. Or Samuel 1 through 3. But they were evil, wicked men. They didn't respect the holiness of God. Number two, they disdained his altar and sacrifices. They seduced the women who came instead of encouraging them spiritually. You know, it'd be like past, some pastors today who sleep with the women in their church instead of 
encouraging them spiritually. Very dangerous thing to do. They don't know God very well. They don't fear God. They think they're saved. No, they're going to go to hell. They don't repent and stop doing that kind of thing. <clears throat> so they seduced the women who came instead of encouraging them spiritually. Number four, instead of ministering to the Lord, they served their own selfish needs. And don't we see a lot of that in ministry today, especially with the Balaam boys serving their own selfish needs. They're, they're willing to lie to people to say God told them something he didn't tell them in order to meet their own selfish needs. And of course, you won't ever have the presence of God in a situation like that. So God raised up Samuel, who was what? A prophet, wasn't he? And Samuel never missed it. For those of you who think prophets can miss it, Samuel never missed it. The word of the Lord says, God let none of his words fall to the ground. <clears throat> and what was the other? What's one of the other things we learned from studying Samuel's life? First Samuel. When Samuel went to a village, people trembled. They were in fear of God. A genuine prophet brings the fear of God into the church. He doesn't have a cavalier attitude. He may proclaim blessings like a lot of prophecies, but he also may speak judgment and very often does. Because what? The purpose of true apostles and prophets, my brothers and sisters, they are the foundational ministry of the church. Ephesians 2.20, the church is built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Jesus Christ being the chief cornerstone. And so, like I've shared before, every month when I, on the 11th, when I read Psalms 11, I mean not on the 11th, it would be on the 2nd, or the 3rd, 3rd day of the month, excuse me, because I read five chapters a day. So on the 3rd, I would read 11 through 15. Psalm 11, 3, if the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? Well, I submit the foundations have been destroyed. And it's the purpose of the genuine apostles and genuine prophets to restore the truthful foundation. You know, you might say to me, and I haven't anyone say this to me other than maybe Evelyn a time or two, but you speak a lot of judgment. You speak a lot about things wrong in the church. Well, yeah, I'm called to do that. I'm called to do that. Because you have to tear down what's not of God before you can build a true foundation. You know, you don't even have to be an engineer. I'm an engineer, but you don't even have to be an engineer to know. You can't build a tall building on a faulty foundation, and you can't build the church on a faulty foundation. So we have to tear down what's not of God. And we have to restore and one of the things we have to restore is the presence of the Lord. Praise God. Praise the Lord. So the priests were commanded not to let the fire go out on the altar. The fire symbolized the holiness and presence of God as Jesus, the light of the world. As a priesthood of believers, we too should never let the fire go out on our altars. Praise God. Praise God. You know, the Lord has had us minister in a church, a number of particular churches, and there's one in Michigan we've ministered at for probably 10 years. And the last time I was there, the Lord gave me a scripture for that church, and it was 1 Kings 18, 21. And, and I actually thought at the time, you know, I've only done this one other time, but I thought, Lord, this can't be for that church. But when I got there, I saw that it was. And 1 Kings 18, 21 is the testimony of Elijah on Mount Carmel when he was confronting the false prophets of Baal. And he said to the people, why do you halt between two opinions? If Baal is God, follow him. But if Jehovah is God, follow him. In other words, quit vacillating. You know what Jesus said about the church of this age? 
and neither hot nor cold, you're lukewarm. No, oh, these people were very cold. They were worshiping Baal. Elijah says, well, if he's God, follow him. But if not, follow Jehovah. And he proved who the real God was, didn't he? And the people said that. Jehovah, he is the God. So, the presence of the Lord is similar to that. We get so busy, so busy. We're so busy today. <laughs> so busy. That's, we don't have time for the Lord. Do you want more of the presence of God in your life? In your ministry? In your church? Maybe you should get flat on the floor, pastor, or your, of your church and just Stay there till God speaks to you, tells you what to do. You don't have to listen to me. God will speak to you. He'll tell you what to do if you'll just lay flat, if you'll pay the price, if you really want it. If you really want the presence of God, a lot of times we don't. And I'm going to share some of the reasons why. Reasons why we don't see God's presence in our lives. Number one, we're too busy with idols. I-D-O-L-S. When the Lord said he was sending me to the church, he said it won't be a pleasant experience and you'll be rejected. He'd given me the same personal prophecy from three separate Africans from Nigeria, one was at my home, two were at, in Akure, same word. It's in Jeremiah 52, thou art my battle axe and weapon of war. Lord says, I'm sending you to the church. And it won't be a pleasant experience and you'll be rejected. But he said, I'm going to shatter the church for her idolatry. And wasn't that the main problem in Israel? Off and on, off and on. Idolatry. Especially when times are good, we don't need God. So we're too busy with our idols. I was reminded of a bumper sticker we saw one time. It said, Jesus is coming soon. Look busy. <laughs> Look busy. Jesus is coming soon. Look busy. If you're worshiping and busy with your idols, my brother and sister, you don't want the presence of the Lord. Because what God showed me in this teaching was when the presence of the Lord shows up, in your life, in your church, it brings you face to face with your idols. You have to choose in that moment. You know this is the presence of God. Do I want this or do I want my idols? Number two, we're impatient. The golden calf is a symbol of that. We don't want to take the time to wait on the Lord. Well, guess what? He's not going to change. I'm the Lord. I change not, we're told in Malachi. Hebrews 13, 8, Jesus Christ. We use that for one of the scriptures to receive healing or miracles. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. So he's not going to change. So if you want more of his presence, you'll have to pay the price for it. And that price is time. I'm talking about in your own life. Time in prayer, especially praying by the Spirit. Time meditating in the Word. You'll have to pay the price for it. Number three, we don't prepare our hearts before a church service. 1 Corinthians 14, 26. In fact, you should probably read chapters 12 through 14 of 1 Corinthians and meditate on them. But Paul wrote that when we come together, we all have a psalm, we all have a prophecy, we all have something. 
And, but if we don't prepare our hearts, we don't bring anything to the service, to the church service. And you're not building up your local body if you're not operating in your gifts. So obey 1 Corinthians 14, 26. And pastors make room for your people to operate in their gifts. Encourage them. Don't stymie them or stifle them. Because if you don't allow them to operate in their gifts, your church will always remain weak and you won't have the presence of God there. And I wrote here in my notes that you can learn a lot about the church and God's presence by reading and meditating 1 Corinthians chapters 12 through 15 several times a week for a few months. Number four, there's a lack of holiness and a fear of the Lord in churches today. Hebrews 12, 14. What does it say? Hebrews 12, 14. You should know it. I quote it all the time. I'm going to read it. Pursue peace with all men and holiness. We're to what? We're to pursue holiness without which no one, how many people? No one will see the Lord. And the fear of God and holiness go hand in hand. What do we see in the book of Acts when Ananias and Sapphira were judged by God? You know, Peter didn't, he didn't prophesy death to them. He just said, why have you lied to the Holy Spirit? And Ananias dropped dead. Then his wife came in. You know, they were being manipulative. They wanted to make it look like they did like everybody else, but they kept back part of the money. Peter said, it was yours, well, you know, but you don't lie about it. And they made a plan, and his wife, and the same thing, she dropped dead. And then what does the word say? It says, fear came upon, and that there were many miracles. We have, to, we have to establish the fear of the Lord and holiness in our churches, not tolerate sin in our churches. Judge it. Five, most churches are following religious spirits instead of the Holy Spirit. The Lord told me that in October of 1991. He said the church is not being led by the Holy Spirit. It's being led by religious spirits. Well, if you want a religious spirit to run your services, the Holy Spirit will just, he'll just stay gone. You won't have the presence of God there. So you've got to follow the Holy Spirit. Number six, most churches lack true worship and their leadership doesn't understand the importance of worship in bringing people into the presence of God. You know, God gave me back in that time of great revelation in the 90s when I was having three, four, five visions a day, night visions at night. One of them I titled The Vision of the Ruins and this church was all burned out and ruined. And there was some black women going there and one of them had a hymn book and I said, if you want that to be a church, you have to come here and worship. We have to worship God. We're created to worship him. That means you have to have true worship, not a form of worship. Most churches lack true worship. They have a form of worship. What did Paul prophesy in the last days? We would have a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. We have a form of worship, not true worship. We have a form of praise. We have a form of the word being preached, the gospel of the kingdom not being preached. We have a form, we have another gospel, a form of godliness. Go back to Jeremiah chapter 7. Read it. God sent Jeremiah down to the temple and proclaimed the word of the Lord to him. 
the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord. Three times. You go out, you commit adultery, you do this, you steal, you rob, you come back here and say, we're, we're delivered to do these things. No, you're not. They forgot the lesson of Leviticus. Be ye holy, for I am holy. And we better not forget it or we won't have the presence of God. We'll have the judgment of God upon us and our churches. It's a time for repentance, my brother and sister. So their leadership doesn't understand the importance of worship in bringing people into the presence of God. And a lot of other people in congregation don't. They look on worship as being uh, subservient to preaching of the word. It's not. It all goes together. I've had services where we didn't preach the word or, you know, we just prayed or we just worshiped God. You know, when the Holy Spirit's in charge, you let him do what he wants to do, not what you want to do. And as I shared in Mysterious Secrets of the Dark Kingdom, the battle for planet Earth, that's subtitle, because it is. One way you can tell if your church is being led by the Holy Spirit is whenever service isn't the same. If every service in your church is the same, you're not being led by the Holy Spirit. That's just something, you don't even have to have the eye of the eagle. You can just take it from me that you'll know if every service is the same. And that's true of almost all denominational churches, isn't it? They're not being led by the Holy Spirit. Number seven, the leadership is unable to follow the Holy Spirit during the service. Remember what I've said over and over, you've got to move with the cloud. If you don't learn to follow the cloud, you won't get to your promised land, will you? And you won't have God fighting for you, will you? And what is the promised land? That's where the honey and milk is, isn't it? So learn to follow the Holy Spirit. Most pastors, and I'm using the term pastor because most people call themselves a pastor when, when, because churches don't operate in five-fold ministry like the Bible, like, like Jesus set the church up. And I'm going to deal with that in another teaching on elders because elders are five-fold ministers, my brother and sister. But you have to learn to follow the Holy Spirit. He is in charge, not you. Amen? Learn that. It's the main thing I tell young ministers in Africa and Asia when I'm overseas or the UK, wherever we are. Learn to follow the Holy Spirit because he doesn't make any mistakes, does he? And if you can learn to follow him, and what is his stamp of approval? It's the anointing. That's why I say, follow the anointing, follow the anointing, follow the anointing, learn to follow the anointing. If you're anointed in worship, don't be trying to be an evangelist. Unless God tells you to, you know, he might use you that way occasionally. But when you're anointed for something, that's God's calling on you. You know, that's your place called there. Learn to follow the anointing. Follow it. Follow the Holy Spirit. That's the anointing. That's his stamp of approval. Number eight, our services are basically always the same, which is what I talked about. We have a form of worship, a form of prayer, a form of the word being preached. But the presence of God's not there. He's not ordaining that. He's just letting us get by. It might be his third will. You know, what are the three wills of God? Perfect, acceptable, amen, good, three wills of God. Maybe, maybe you're in the good part. Maybe you're in acceptable, but you're not in the perfect will of God. Number nine, we are so full of ourselves that there's no room for the Lord who works through empty vessels. 
You know, there's so much emphasis, and it's been this way for a long time. When I was a Baptist, they would put it on the wall. You know, how many was in Sunday school? How many were in, they had a service at night called Training Union, and it was good. You were trained as a young, as a teenager or a young a, a woman or a man. You were trained for service. They call that Training Union. It met from 6 to 7, and then you had your evening, your Sunday uh, evening worship from 7 o'clock on, how long has it lasted. Training union, good thing to have. We need to be trained, don't we? Amen? But today, it's all about getting my needs met and, and numbers. How many How many you got? You know, we got a mega church. It, it, the church is arrogant. We've become arrogant. So many ministers are arrogant. They have a big name, but, they're, but they don't have humility, so God can't use them much. Learn to follow the anointing and the Holy Spirit and the presence of God. He told me in 1997, don't ever, ever judge a church or a ministry by how big it is, how much money they have, or how many people are there. He said, you only judge it by the anointing. And what is the anointing? The anointing is part of the presence of the Lord. It's not the fullness of his presence. But like I said, learn to follow the anointing and then you'll be in his will. He can only pour himself out and work through empty vessels. We need to empty ourselves. You know, there's a principle that people don't understand, a lot of them, about the Lord. And it's in, it's in uh, Paul's theology. And it's called kenosis. Kenosis is in Philippians. And kenosis is a Greek word that means emptying. Jesus, as the Son of God, emptied himself of all his divine privileges. That's why the Bible says he increased in wisdom. How can God, God can't increase in wisdom. Jesus did. Jesus God, yes. He was God who took on the form of a man, but he emptied himself of all of that, which is why he had to be baptized by the Spirit at the River Jordan. And after that experience, then he said, I don't do anything except what I see the Father do. In other words, I'm just going to move with the cloud. He was just as much the son of God, my brother and sister, but he emptied himself. People think, well, he did those miracles because he was a son of God. No, he didn't. My father in me does the works. The Holy Spirit does the work, just like he does through you. It's no difference. The difference between Jesus and you, Jesus in the flesh in you and me, is he lived without sin. We don't. He increased in wisdom. Why? How? By following the Spirit. By learning the principles and ways of God in the flesh like we have to. Praise the Lord. Hope you understand that. And so back in that time, this is about 30 years ago, the Lord showed me how we get more of Him in us you know, be filled with the Spirit. Doesn't the Word say that over and over? How do we do that? It's by emptying ourselves of ourself. Jesus emptied himself of his godly character and characteristics, his omnipotence. You know, Jesus didn't know everything. He operated in the Word of Knowledge by the Spirit. His Father knows everything. We don't know everything. We have to we, we rely on the spiritual gifts like Jesus did in the flesh. But to walk more by the Spirit, we have to empty ourselves of ourselves. That's what he showed me. It's the antithesis of Jesus. He emptied himself of his godly character, power, privileges, and took on himself the nature of a man, as Paul wrote in this kenosis, this emptying. 
and we have to empty our we have to empty ourselves of self. And that's why another reason why we don't have the presence of God in so many churches because it's become all about getting our needs met. Well, what about the needs of Jesus? He has needs to be met. He has people he wants saved. He has people in that service he wants to be healed. You should go back, if you're a pastor especially, you should go back on our website and read my article that I wrote about 10 years ago titled Mrs. Smith and Other Inconvenient Truths About the Modern Day Church. Mrs. Smith. Because most churches have a Mrs. Smith or a Mr. Smith in them, or sometimes several. So we have to empty ourselves of self and we have to prepare our hearts for the service, as I said earlier. That's, those two go together. What can I do for you today, Lord? Do you want me to prophesy? Do you have something for me to do? Is there someone there you want me to pray for? Instead of just getting up late and throwing our clothes on and running to church. And as I said beginning, if you think about it, there's really no reason to have a a church service if, if the Lord's presence is not going to be there. So what do we have to do to restore the presence? What do we have to do? Well, number one, we have to have true worship and anointed praise in our services. You know, my wife and I have stopped church worship services and said, you know, you're getting up to here and you're going back down. We're not ascending. We have to ascend into the presence of the Lord in worship and praise. Its purpose is to bring us in to the presence of the Lord. And if it's not doing that, then you need to work on it. This is a major problem in churches in Africa or African churches even here. The worship's not anointed. It's just singing and jumping around and dancing and all those things are good. Those are fine to begin, but then you have to move into true worship if you want the presence of the Lord to be there. You have to move in to true worship and be sensitive to the Holy Spirit. Number two, you remember the bread of the presence in the tabernacle, the show bread, as the King James refers to it, the bread of the presence, bread of what? Presence. If we don't have true bread, we're not going to have the presence of God, are we? We can't be preaching another gospel. So we have to teach the word only. We have to teach the doctrine of the apostles. And if you don't know what the doctrine of the apostles is, you need to learn what it is. In the New Testament, learn what it is. Doctrine, of course, just means teaching. Number three, we need to pursue the presence via a return to holiness and the fear of the Lord in our services. We need to fear and reverence God in our services not grieve the Spirit of God so that he leaves. Number four, we need to allow the Holy Spirit to control the service. You know, my wife and I were at the largest Pentecostal church in Portland, and we were on the front row next to the executive pastor and the senior pastor. And during the worship, and the, the worship was anointed, but... The executive pastor was was given the task of finding out about demon possession and some of the things that he learned about in Mysterious Secrets, and so that's why we were there. But I turned to him during the service of trying to teach him how to follow the Spirit, and I they had a huge uh, worship team and musicians. Uh, There's probably 50 people there at that church. And I said, see that woman up on the top playing the violin? The Lord wants her to come down here in front and begin to play and worship him. 
pastor didn't do it. The executive pastor, he, he was not, he was afraid to stop the service. But that's what the spirit wanted. So you've got to learn to follow the Holy Spirit, my brother and sister. It may seem strange. He may tell you to get down on your face. He may tell you to lay flat, whatever. You got to learn to follow the spirit if you want the presence of the Lord because the number one thing that you have to do to qualify yourself, and you can always disqualify yourself, Saul did from being king. What is it? It's obedience. Remember what the prophet Samuel said to Saul, obedience is better than sacrifice. God says, I don't care about all the sacrifices you give, you, you, you know, everything you're doing, claiming to be a sacrifice, if you're not going to be obedient to me. And unfortunately today, my brother and sister, and, and that's the message of Leviticus, holiness, most people don't want to be holy. They want Jesus to be like a, a bellhop at a five-star hotel and meet all their needs and wants and to jump every time they holler, but they, they don't want to take the time to develop character or holiness, or the fear of the Lord. They are pursuing happiness, not holiness. And you'll never have the presence of the Lord in your life, if that's your attitude, or in your church, pastor, if you allow that. You have to pursue holiness. Key principle of the book of Leviticus. So we have to restore, number five, we have to restore the presence of God in our own personal lives, isn't it? Because the whole is a reflection of each individual, isn't it? And in our church services, it wouldn't do any good for the pastor to make this commitment if you're not willing to do it. It needs to be done as a church. And I can promise you today that if you'll make the effort to do this, that God will accomplish it in your church. He told me so. If you'll pay the price and you'll seek him for holiness and for his presence and you'll cry out for it, you'll want it more than the air you breathe. He will restore it to your church. And then when he shows up every service, you probably won't have to pray for many people for healing or miracles. You know, God's, I was sharing with a pastor in Kenya yesterday. I was speaking with a pastor in Kenya who wants to establish a training center. And he's been, he's had a Bible school for 20 years training ministers, but he, he wants to establish a training center. And, and I was sharing these, some of these things with him how we, we have to pay the price. We have to want it. We have to show God that we're hungry for more of his presence. Because he's gentle and he's holy. He loves us, but he can't do much for us or he can't manifest himself to us or he can't manifest his presence. if we don't become the priesthood of believers we're supposed to be and separate ourselves through holiness and prayer and fasting and all these things that we know to do. Praise the Lord. So I hope this has been a blessing to you today. I hope you'll make a commitment to meditate on this. Let the Holy Spirit speak to you and reveal to you what you need to do in your own life to restore holiness and restore the presence of the Lord so that your church 
can also restore the holiness and presence of the Lord. Let's pray. Father, I just thank you for this word. I pray that you seal it up in the hearts of your people. Lord, that you speak to them by your Holy Spirit, the great teacher of the church. That he would manifest himself to them so that they'll understand more your presence, your holiness, and your sanctification and how you called us to be a holy priesthood of believers unto you. I thank you for blessing my, your people, Lord, my brothers and sisters. I thank you for pouring them out a blessing that there'll not be room enough to contain it. And I thank you for using their lives for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise the Lord. Well, this is Brother J.P. Timmons of Christ Church International, www.ccipublishing.net. Go to our online bookstore, order some books that will help you grow in your Christian walk. And remember, we're always on the battlefield, and our enemy is Satan. Have a blessed Lord's Day and a blessed week in Jesus' name.